A wonderful good evening to all of you who are attending our session today. I hope everybody can hear me. Can you all give a quick reaction of a thumbs up or a smiley so that I can know that all of you can hear us and see us? Fantastic. Great. So my name is Reshma Roy Suvish, and I have been heading the marketing for Zoho's finance suite of apps. That's an amazing number of thumbs up. Thank you all. So today we have our very own Sridhar Vembu, who has graciously accepted to deliver a session on being financially prudent in these economic times. Now, for as long as I can remember, ever since I joined Zoho, there has never been a quarter that has gone by when Sridhar has not updated us, up, us about how the company is doing or how the market is, or how we should prepare ourselves for the future. In fact, it always ends with the cautionary line on, live frugally, spend wisely, and pay your debts. In fact, not so long ago, markets were at an all-time high, valuations were going off the roof, and both businesses and people were recovering from the pandemic. Life seemed all good. In spite of all of that, we could always hear Sridhar's cautionary note on how you, can, you should be self-reliant and how to be cautious. But things are changing now. Every day you see an article about an upcoming recession or a slowdown. Now, we don't know what the future will hold for us, but I think it's in all our best interest to be prepared. And that's why we have Sridhar here today, where he's going to share his experience and his insights on how businesses can survive and not only survive, but also strive during these times and how they should prepare themselves. Sridhar, thank you so much for doing this session with us. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Reshma. And uh, a very warm uh, welcome to all of you. Namaskar. So we are, uh, I'm actually addressing you from our Chennai office. It's good to actually see the energy of the office. Finally, I'm you know, about 60, 70% of our staff are back in the office. So I'm also happy to be here. So this uh, topic today, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, how to navigate uh, funding and economic winter. This is based on our own experience uh, from two bus, two bubbles and two bus we have navigated before. One was, the, of course, the dot com telecom bubble of 2000, and then later the big housing bubble that culminated in the global financial crisis in 2008-9. Both of these are uh, really uh, difficult bubbles to navigate. And we learned some lessons along the way. And that's what I want to share with you now. So let's get, uh, first I'll just preliminaries. Financial conditions are getting tougher. Interest rates are going up all over the world because inflation is high. And so this means when financial conditions get tougher, it really means funding, particularly venture capital or private equity funding may not be easy to come by. So you are a uh, uh, lot, lot more difficult funding environment. And even when funding is available, the valuations are going to be a lot lower. So you are, uh, uh, what we saw in 2021, is not going to be available in 2022 or beyond. And the valuations to catch up with what was at the bubble peak could take many years. And we saw that with, uh, with the 2000 bust, that it took uh, several years for valuations to come back to anything like what it was before. So that's something that it is best to assume this. Uh, and and that would be my operating assumption now. And of course, the, this advice you hear a lot. So I'm not going to belabor this. The most common advice is to stop the immediate ble bleeding, become cash flow positive quickly. That is what uh, everybody will tell you. And that is good advice. This is what emergency room doctors do. They say stabilize the patient first. And that is very important. But I'm not going to focus on that part here. I'm going to focus on what do you do after the immediate danger is passed. So, and of course, in the emergency room, they always teach you, do not panic. Because panic never helps in these situations. And keep perspective. And what do, we, what do I mean by that? I used to actually tell people in 2001, 2 and even 2008, 9, all of that. Let's keep perspective, right? We, no one in this, no one listening to this. You know, if you are, uh, uh, if you have the income, all of that to be uh, on Twitter and all social media and listen to this, well, you're not going to start with it, right? 
things may times may get difficult but we'll find some way to make a living so do not panic keep perspective that's very important i actually remind myself and remind our people on this so that's important when I mean, there are truly dangerous ones where you have to panic like nuclear war war that is a time to panic but business downturns are not to panic it is to keep calm keep our perspective and then immediately that comes with the there is a strong temptation to blame someone uh blame someone who misled us or blame this or blame that and then in fighting starts this is very common during downturns as i say success has many fathers and failure is an orphan and that's when the blame arises so it's a natural tendency please resist it because there is absolutely no point in you know retro conducting retrospection on what went wrong why did we make these mistakes all of that so that is what i try to avoid in downturns then having said this now focus on what is next what comes after that so as i mentioned my focus is what can you do medium to long term after that immediate sort of bleeding you have started and assume that you cut back your uh, uh, your uh, maybe a lot of it is maybe marketing spending a lot of it is your customer acquisition cost you bring that under control so that you have some semblance of a balance between your what is coming in and what is going out and now what do you do next what is your medium to long term that is what i am going to focus on in this presentation a lot and this is the first one i'll tell you during tough times and the tough times are coming and you know all the layoff news all of that take care of your employees be a strong pillar of support for them you have to keep you know uh, giving them what is the status so that means over communicate be very open about the status of the company we have 3 months of runway left we have 6 months of runway left over communicate and keep in mind that even if some people you let go because you have to lay off and that's sometimes inevitable they will appreciate if you are honest rather than you say that hey we only have 6 months and if within 2 3 months we don't do this we may have to let people go that is honesty then people have time to prepare for it maybe find another job all of this so please over communicate be open about the financial status of the company the worst thing to do is suddenly one morning people uh, log in and discover that their jobs are gone that is the worst way to do it so please don't do it prepare your people over communicate that's very important and take care of your people so it means that even if you have to let go someone and figure out how what they will be doing next all of it and this is important the loyalty you demonstrate to your people now during hard times harder times is what you will receive during good times during rosy times so this is a time for you to demonstrate your loyalty to your people that's how i will view this so think of it as a positive that way what can you do for your people and then there is a looking beyond that what do you do first analyze the market opportunity that you have what was the market target market what is your product and market fit and reanalyze that because that there may be assumptions that may now have to change due to the bubble burst that's very critical i will I'll go into some detail on this because you are nature of the market itself may be bubble driven and the assumptions we made during good times may not hold anymore so this is the first one right is there really a durable market opportunity for our product or service offer or this is the tough one is the opportunity itself a creation of the bubble and how do we know this well take a inventory of all your customers and are they all in a similar Or, or, or are they all concentrated in a particular segment, and the segment itself is losing traction, or are they all money losing companies? And this was actually true for us. If uh, in, I'll, I'll go into some detail about our situation in the 2000 bust, but what we found was that a lot of our customers were themselves losing money. Most of our customers at that point, and that is a red flag because even if we make money, if our customers are not making money, 
is that market opportunity real is the opportunity real or is it something created by the bubble itself and so this was actually our bubble time story 97 to 2000 we grew from about 300k to 8 million and this was the go go years of dot com telecom bubble in one year 99 to 2000 we tripled in terms of revenue we went from about 2.2 to 2.3 million all the way to 8 plus million so and in 2001 we reached 12 million run rate right before that september 11th attacks and so that was it was already looking wobbly by then middle of 2001 and then after that the bottom simply fell out of the market and 2002 3 very hard years and that crash hit us hard so he said and uh, those two years two and a half years i mean starting in somewhere in mid 2001 it was declining treading water lot of soul searching what can we do now what is better all of that that was how the times were then and this is the time when we had to face those tough questions and this is what i actually mentioned we concluded that the market we were in the software for network equipment vendors is not going to be a long term durable market this is a really this is a painful conclusion but i remember preparing our employees for it talking about this preparing the ground for this because we have to now find new opportunities and reinvent ourselves even though we were doing okay in the sense that by 2003 uh, our revenues had stabilized there was no growth but it was at least not going down and we were making some profit you know we had uh, dimensioned ourselves so that with that revenue we were able to make some money but we realized that this is not going to last this opportunity itself is not durable and arriving at that conclusion was odd because this is what tends to happen in these you get comfortable with the particular market segments you think that that particular market segment is you your entire identity as a company is wrapped up in that particular market and so declaring that this particular market is not going to serve us for the long term is very hard it's sort of like you deciding that you know decide to change your profession really that's what it means when you change market segments right completely and uh, that is something that we had to to really uh, face that truth at that time it also meant admitting that our further efforts on the market would be a waste of time this was even harder because we had projects or and d projects uh, doing more in that market segment and i had to pull the plug on those and reallocate a lot of people uh, about 50% of the company in about a 3 month period engineering teams were reallocated actually 50% really and the remaining 50% also another about uh, 50% of that so overall about 75% got reallocated within about one year and that was uh, one of the challenging times and we had about uh, 350 people so these were not trivial numbers about over 200 people got reassigned uh, to different market segments different products completely new products in fact uh, what we see as all these tools now zoho all of this came from the tree the re, uh, reprioritizing or uh, retargeting a pivot towards new market segments and these the, the idea that your market segment you are in may not be durable for the long haul it itself might be a product of the bubble and as i mentioned why that conclusion was because most of our customers over 90% of our customers at the time were themselves losing money and it was clear that it was very they were in very overcrowded segment we were not extremely overcrowded serving them but most of them were really doing the same thing and there were too many companies doing this in silicon valley at that time there were over 200 companies that were all doing optical networking and a lot of them most of them were our customers and most of them none of them had any hope of making money and so even though we were making money they were not so we had to face the reality that they may not be there long term and they were not actually within 2 3 years essentially most of them 99% of them disappear so how you face that 
Now you have analyzed your market segment. You are convinced that there is a market beyond the bubble burst. Are there too many well-funded players chasing this? So or do you have a market, but there are too many players? So that is your next question. Because if there is a market and still there's too many players, nobody may be able to make money. That is the second big question that comes up when you analyze markets. So this then raises the thing. Can we actually profitably address this market? We are convinced that the market exists, but there are too many maybe well-funded players. Do we have an opportunity to, to profitably address that market? Because ultimately you are in business to turn a profit too, right? Without profit, there's no long-term business. So can we profitably address that market that exists? Or are there too many players for everyone to be profitable? And this is where I came up with this uh, uh, this particular concept I call organically profitably addressable market. We call it OPAP. So what is organically profitably addressable market? This means that if you are, you know, you have to be profitable, of course. Organically means you are not going and acquiring uh, market share by uh, making acquisitions. You are not spending more than you have. And so can we, what is the size of that market? And this is the key point, actually. The OPAM is often a lot smaller than optimistic projections we tend to use during fundraising. And in fact, it is also a lot smaller than what other you know, big spending vendors may view as market size. So it is that's why I said organically part, organically profitable addressable market is uh, that smaller subset of the market that you can profitably target. And because this this the reason why that market size is smaller, the small sub segment is. In our growth projections, we would have assumed substantial marketing spend and the associated cash buy. In other words, the big market size is only achievable if you are willing to spend a lot of money and incur a cash buy. And the problem now is we don't have that cash available, so we have to pull back. And when we pull back, what is the new market size? That is the OPAM market. This is the market that we can address profitably. So when you cut that marketing spending to stop the bleeding, growth projections will take a hit. So you know if you are expecting 60, 70% growth, you may have to settle for 20%, 15% growth. And so we end up with a far smaller OPAM. And this is the very critical thing to understand because our growth projections in the go-go years may not be valid. And we have to settle for much smaller growth, but profitable growth. So that's why this, I want you to remember this organically profitably addressable market. We call it OPAM in our company. Then we, I'll give you an example. In 2000, we had, we had about 8 million revenue. We had two major competitors in that market segment, which is uh, serving the network equipment companies, optical networking companies, all of that. They were each doing about 50 million in revenue. We were only doing about 8 million in revenue. But here is a critical point. At 8 million, we were actually profitable. At 50 million, those companies were not profitable. So we actually estimated the OPAM to be only about 10 million for that market. Which I felt that the 50 million they were doing is bubble. And really only you can do about 10 million in any reasonable, uh, profitable way, reasonably profitable way. The rest of that, what they were doing, the whatever 90 million plus they were showing as revenue between them, was mostly I felt was bubble money that they were taking. And sure enough, those two competitors went bust by 2004. So 2000, they peaked in revenue, maybe 50 million. 2004, they were gone. And we actually continued over that 10 million business profitably for many years, 10 plus years, actually. So we, we, were, we were stuck at that 10 million in that business, but we could continue for 10 plus years and the companies that reach that quick 50 million mark quickly in that market by spending a lot of money being unprofitable, they went bust. And this is the, here the problem, right? The 10 million is not going to be exciting for venture capitalists, but they are looking for billion dollar markets. 
But what we did is the profits we made from the 10 million revenue, we invested that in new market opportunities. Eventually, those new market opportunities is what led us to Zoho and all of that. Now this presentation is on our platform, right? And uh, and our Zoho Books team is here. All of those products were born out of all that. Uh, the profits we were making in those days, we were able to invest in new R&D. And so here's a key question. If the OPAM is a lot smaller than bubble expectation, instead of 200 million market, you only have a 10 million market. And sometimes, you know, instead of a billion dollar market, you have only a 20 million market. Can you reasonably size the company to that smaller OPAM? In other words, you have to let go of the billion dollar projections. Can you be profitable with 20, 30 million revenue, which might be the OPAM for that, right? And this is a critical question because this is not going to excite anyone, but what you have to do is, can you reinvent your way to growth from that smaller but much stronger foundation? Because now you are profitable. You are able to invest. So this is my uh, 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 real question. If you are able to make that uh, 20 million, 30 million profitably, can you reinvent your way to growth from that smaller foundation? Which is what we did. We only had the 10 million business in 2003, 4 but we invested in new products, new markets, and then we started growing. By about 2005, we were growing again into new markets, and this foundation set us for a much longer term growth, which is continuing to this day. So this is the key takeaway here. Ensure that there is a durable market, meaning ensure that your market itself is not a bubble creation. Be realistic about the market size, estimate the OPAM, and be mindful for how many players are targeting this market. And this is these are medium term advice. Now I'll go to a bit longer term. Here, you have to rethink your fundamental business models. And I'm going to share with you how I think about business models. So there is a trap. I'm going to call it the trap. I call it costly inputs, commodity output. This is a trap. So what it means is the inputs to the business are rising in price. Your output is a commodity subject to you know, price pressure. Then you're trapped. And if a critical input is so costly and huge part of your final product value, are you a, a real company or are you a reseller of that input? Right? You, are, you have to face this. It's okay to be a reseller, but you have to accept that that's a different business model. And you have to understand the risks involved in all of that. And uh, if you are dependent on costly inputs and your value addition is low, and maybe your gross margin is only 20%, 25%, you have to understand that uh, a retailer will have 25% gross margin. And all your inputs you add up and you're adding only 25% value. Then you have to wonder, you know, what is the risk in this business model? Well, the risk is, you are subject to input price increases. Now in inflationary times, this can happen. Or output price due to competition because that's a commodity output. So the costly input commodity output happens. This can happen, for example, I, I'll give you some examples. You may have a critical part like a very high speed camera or something on top of which you built a system. A lot of the value of that is an high speed camera where there are only two vendors, let's say. Now your product adds value on top but not so much. And if the price of these high-speed cameras doubles, but you are not able to raise your price correspondingly, you, make it more, you can only increase it by 30-40%, your business has become much more precarious. So this is why it's very important to understand the risk involved in this type of a model. And what is a more durable model then? And this is where I actually have come up with a, uh, uh, an approach to it. I call it high gross margin, low prices. This actually sounds like a contradiction. How can you have high gross margin, but low prices? Well, you can, because then it really means is that you are the one adding most of the value for your product. You are not simply buying and packaging and selling. And that is, that is the, so the, what the customer pays, most of the value is added by your company. And then you are able to withstand swings because your gross margin allows you to 
which stands swings in the business and it may this is why they mentioned it long term because this type of thinking high gross margin low price uh, business model may require you to rethink your product and your business models so that's why the short term you stop the bleeding and immediate term you analyze your markets understand what is a costly input commodity output kind of traps and finally you are you have to rethink how you get to that high gross margin low prices models so this is a take away here i'm going to wrap it up and then open up for questions so first take care of your people most important that's why i listed number 1 find your opam organically profitably addressable market avoid the trap of the costly inputs commodity output and aim for high gross margin low prices so this is like a short to medium to long term the fourth one is long term the first one is immediately this you should do communicate take care of your people all of that so this is how i view this and with these you know nobody can guarantee results in business no strategy can ever guarantee but with these at least you can say you did your very best you gave it your very best and let the universe take care of you thank you and uh, best wishes to all of you thank you now i'll open for questions uh so before we open up for the question i have two questions of my own so you mentioned uh, during your session that uh, we have gone through many downturns right and we survived those but however our competitors were not able to and they had gone bust why do you think uh, that happened and what made uh, you know the competitors unable to adapt to the changes during that point any insights or thoughts on that so yeah, they got used to that 50 million kind of revenue for from that market it turned out and i i i estimated that the customers are either overpaying or they were hyper inflating their value addition meaning they were not really adding value but during the bubble people were willing to pay those prices so the real the 50 million revenue wasn't real in a sense but they couldn't adapt to that change I meaning they couldn't go from 50 million to realizing this has to be a much smaller business so they somehow kept you know this is a very common pitfall where you don't accept that hey we can do maybe 10 20 million profitably 50 million unprofitably and it won't survive they could not adjust to that so they preferred going bust over adjusting to the reduced circumstances in that market okay thank you okay and this is one very simple and easy question okay let's go back in time uh the shridhar when he was 25 years old what was his personal finance mantra and has it changed over a period of time yeah even i mean something's never changed at 25 i was very reluctant to take on debt i mean the only debt i would have would be for a home mortgage that was all i ever had even for buying a car or something i wouldn't take on debt I, if i hadn't saved the money i wouldn't buy so that way i'll buy a lesser car than in other words the common thing is you go and buy a car and only let the monthly payment pay for it so i would uh, buy a cheaper car because then or a used car i bought used cars before because that's all i can afford with cash so that attitude was there even at uh, 25 and that's something that has endured in many ways of course the business is much much bigger now from a business part perspective i think about how our employees can live like this of course each person makes their own decisions but i would like to at least enable our employees to live like this because this is the most stress free way way to live if people don't have debt people have some adequate question of savings people have a good job a lot of basic problems go away then then you have reduced the overall stress that is what i would like to tell and i'm that's being stress free that way is why 25 years in now i'm still able to keep going that you know i've not burnt out so okay thanks shreda okay so when we started promoting this session we had also put up a tab where people could ask questions so i'll probably ask those questions first and then i'll take up the live questions which have come through now so let's start with the first one i'm going to project the question this was asked by pankaj agarwal uh, looking at the current dynamic financial environment how do we create a business plan for the next 5 years and ensure we meet the achieved goal yeah so one second let me this phone keeps So yeah, repeat the question, please. I'm sorry. Okay. 
So this is by Pankaj. Uh, he's asked, uh, looking at the current dynamic financial environment, how do we create a business plan for the next five years and ensure we meet the achieved goal? Yeah. So I mentioned the, uh, the medium term things. First, assess the market opportunity with a new, uh, uh, new look, new pair of eyes, really. So new spectacles, because what assumptions we made in the boom time are no longer valid. And what is the state of the competition? How many competitors are likely to be um, well-funded and, and fighting in this? So assess all that and come up with a very realistic plan, realistic growth assumptions. Because we don't want to make our most optimistic projections into sort of enshrined into our real goals. Okay, And uh, so be realistic and dimension our cost to that. For example, there may be ways to lower your the cost of living for your employees by choosing lower cost locations. That's what our rural uh, expansion is. All of that you do, then you are able to, uh, no, the key of course is to, to be profitable so that there is a uh, month in, no, quarter to quarter, you are able to bring in enough to pay the bills. And then having achieved that, uh, then you can actually from a, the durable foundation plan for growth. Got it. Next, we move on to uh, the question by Mr. Lalit Pawar. The world had gone through so many crises and recessions in the past, and now also we are going through the same situation due to the consequences of the pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine war. So how should businesses and startups prepare themselves for this kind of situation and how can they cope with this situation? I think you've covered it, but still, you know. I've um, covered this, and as I said, first is to not panic, not play the blame game, all that. Because those are tempting and very, very easy to fall into those traps. And then you, uh, given the magnitude of the the crisis ahead, the world faces from uh, uh, the war, the inflation, commodity prices. Of course, we see the oil prices, all of that. They have hit a new record yesterday. So all of these, what is the realistic market opportunity we are in? Do we still matter in are we still relevant this was the question i mentioned in the in that uh, uh, optical communication market where i asked is this market going to be there and are we still relevant to the world with what we are offering should we be doing something else these are the questions to ask and whatever it is you have to have a sort of a, a sense of uh, detached calmness about it Remind yourself that, hey, whatever it is, we'll make a living somehow. We may have to take up a job, whatever. But only if you're calm and unstressed can you even come up with good answers. So that is what I would suggest. All right. Next, we move on to um, Mr. Vishal Krishna's question, slightly longer. Sridhar, from central banking ecosystems to blockchain-led decentralized finance, I see two forces building a narrative here. What do you foresee as a new political and economic order for citizens to get used to as price rise for all aspects of life? Do you see economic stability in decentralization or will it always be a case where monetary authority will remain centralized? You always maintain that deficits to fuel consumption is the problem. I think he's one of your followers on Twitter too. Yeah. So I uh, definitely see a continued role for uh, not just central banks, but really state-backed money. They may adopt blockchain as a technology, central banks, but still I believe the concept of money itself requires the, the concept of a state to back it. And there is, of course, many people uh, uh, think that decentralized, completely decentralized currency like Bitcoin will become a global currency of some kind. I believe that ultimately state banking will be backing will be necessary. And of course, gold is already there for a non-state bank form of long-term durable money. So between gold and central bank, state-backed, uh, could be blockchain money. That is how I will place my bets. That's just my bias, of course. All right. Next question coming up is by Smith. Uh, let me project that as well. Um, hey, Shridhar, I wanted to ask, what are the key learnings and advice for initial phase of a bootstrap startup? I would love if you could elaborate on how to grow from scratch, which areas to specifically invest money for growth and development. 
Well, if you are bootstrapped, you have to find those customers who are willing to pay for your offering. Right? That's the first step. You have to find the first five customers, first 10, first 100, all of them. That's where your challenge is likely to be. And I'll tell you, if you go back in 96, 97, our first challenge is how to find those customers to so that we can put food on the table. That is the key thing in bootstrap because there is no other external source of funding by definition, bootstrap. So you may have to be uh, adapt to a particular customer needs. I'll give you an example because that example will illustrate. Our very first customers were in a very narrow segment, the networked printer mentors, the, 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 the massive printers you see in offices which are networked where from your uh, computer you send a job, print job there. Those vendors had a particular problem at that time. So the printing market, the big printer vendor is in the world is HP. They also had the software to manage all those printers, network printers. But then they were the leader in that software as well, the network management software. Other printer vendors, many of them Japanese, they had the printers, network printers, but they did not have the software to manage. And they cannot go to HP because HP is their primary competition for the printers. So we nicely found a niche where these vendors could found, find our software useful and we could profitably serve their need. So we had the software ready and this market, you know, we, if we competed directly with HP in the much broader management market, it was hard. But we could go to the other printer vendors and they were, uh, you know, they were willing to buy from us, do business with us because they could not do business with HP, which is their main competition. So this is an example. So this is how you have to find a, a market segment, which could be a segment of just one customer, could be just two customers. So, but you have to find that somehow and land a business, solve that problem, then use that as a, as a foundation to grow from that. Next question. How do you think a startup focusing on robotics and AI thrive in this bubble burst? You're going into niche segments now. Yeah, I, you know, I'm no expert on robotics, nor can I really talk a lot about AI because everything has AI now. I don't know if there's an AI market as such now. But regardless, I mean, all the things that I've talked about matter. Uh, take robotics. Now, it's going into factory automation, let's say. That's a you know, particularly uh, uh, important segment. So you want to find a particular segment within that factory automation where you can thrive. You cannot define yourself as I will solve all the problems. You have to go into a particular segment and say that, how do we solve the customer problem here? This may require working with one customer, one important customer for a few month period, making sure that they accept your product offering, they find use for it, all of that. So that is how I will do it in that segment. And AI is similar where, again, uh, you may have to find other vendors, other companies that need your offering, and then make them adopt your offering as part of it. So in other words, when you are bootstrapping, when you are a small company, larger companies that have a need for this may be your customers, not direct end customers. So that's that intermediate or the so-called OEM market that might be very valuable. All right. The next question is, uh, I think this has been uh, a question that is mind of a lot of people. How do I retain my best people? I have three employees and they leave when the market provides a 20% salary jump. Unfortunately, that salary match is not possible in the short term. Yeah. So this is something I addressed in my presentation. You, you demonstrate your loyalty to your people. And then what you uh, uh, receive is the loyalty longer term. So this is not addressable very short term, like how do I retain people? It's not, no, because you will essentially involve coercion, all of that, and all of that will go down well. Okay. If you're going to say you have to give me three month notice, six month notice period, all that is not a good idea. So don't do all those things. Okay. Don't be employee unfriendly. But if you demonstrate loyalty, you can earn loyalty in return. This can only be done medium to long term. Okay. Um, next question, we at Orga Plants are working towards making farming a profitable business with data science, but our team is very small. 
given that data science and agriculture is a very vast subject do you have any advice for us please this is by tejas yeah i'd say i mean if you in this thing and i'm studying this market your urban reasonably affluent customer for example it employees who want to eat healthy would be your market and they are willing to pay a decent price so for example uh, milk uh, there are people who are selling 100 120 rupees a liter for really good milk raw milk from cows or uh, uh, they can profitably sell this to particular small segments of affluent customers so that is where you know given your uh, focus you have to find that maybe you have a direct to customer retail outlet or you have a, a distribution method where your produce reaches them directly maybe every week or every day if possible all of that so you have to have that in other words you have to link from the uh, farm to the kitchen fairly without too many intermediate layers because those layers are what take away all your cross margin out of that so you know i will uh, uh, offer this as for the data science part i'm not uh, well versed in how you're applying data science there but i can see this problem as putting together the uh, your produce to the customer who's willing to pay the best price for it efficiently got it next question we have is from aditi and she's asking uh, assume i'm starting up i want to start a app based service but also want to r&d for ai vision do you think with a great team i will be able to pull it off will you recommend something like this will we will bc see this positively yeah so if you are any r&d effort to start you have to assume that it will take a while it takes longer than you take your estimate of when you can finish it and double it and still it might be a you know, underestimate the r&d projects have that uh, particular uh, issue and we have you know zoho books we have not known this right when we got into accounting software we thought it will be there in 2 3 years and then it took another 2 3 years because the first version we had to rewrite all of that so this is actually a very common phenomenon uh, so you have to be ready for that and how do you pay your bills during the time when you are when you are spending all this so that's where you have to uh, either no vc is out to believe you which is harder during a downturn and you may have to have a track record for them or some way you are persuasive for them or what if vcs don't uh, invest in you what is your strategy how do you pay for it so these are the things you have to answer and you maybe you'll take up some small projects for companies that need your expertise and deliver those projects in maybe it could be a 2 3 month project you are able to deliver and the money you come in you are able to invest in further r&d so these are some of the suggestions i have okay. thanks shridhar um next question is slightly different but how do you see the adoption of gig economy in india and what will be the impact this is by muthu swami yeah uh um, i believe the gig economy itself will go towards a more employment model it's already happening in the us i believe that will happen in india as well because it's uh, honest approach is to actually employ people offer them uh, decent pay decent working conditions offer a career path for people all of it the gig economy assumes that there is a vast pool of labor that is unattached they'll do this today they'll do that tomorrow all of that but that's not what most people actually want if you ask even the gig economy workers some of them may like the flexibility of that most of them want a steady job a steady paycheck uh, some stability all of that so companies that offer that in my opinion will do better long term all right next up is the question from dhavil um what are the characteristics of opam how do you define this in any vertical yeah so this could be you know the we defined it in a particular vertical this is opam is a very specific to a market segment let's say you are going after software for uh, uh, you know tutoring agencies or something like that right so maybe you you go from being an edtech that is burning money to selling software for uh, more modest coaching centers all of that let's say just i'm just giving you the opam might be much smaller and how do you reach them so this is where you have to analyze instead of multi billion dollar uh, ed tech you may have multi million dollar software that is particular market segment so you have to define uh, this that way and 
each market segment has its own dynamic. But the key to me is, of course, the profitable nature of it and your ability to organically serve it. That is, we're able to get customers without spending a lot upon the customer acquisition cost. Because customer acquisition cost is what sinks a lot of business models today. All right, thank you. Next up is the question from Abhirami. Uh, I think you've covered it again, but so how do you handle uh, during your tough times? Of course, uh, when it comes to business, we all also have to face losses. So how do you handle that situation? Yeah. So if you are uh, making losses, of course, the first thing is to stop the bleeding. You have to find ways. And my suggestion is first, you have to level with your people. You have to uh, take your company along and have an open conversation, a presentation where you explain the facts, where we are, what do we face, what are the challenges, why are we losing money, how do we stanch the losses, all of that you have to do. So that is the uh, first thing to do. This is what I always do. And I first make sure that our employees understand what is the nature of the market we are in, what is the nature of the environment we are in, what are the immediate challenges we face, all of that have to be communicated. And then you also have to personally, this is a personal advice, stay calm as much as possible. This is why meditation, yoga, a lot of that come in because it's not, it's not merely just about business models, all that. You have to stay strong and calm within and have to you know, gain some perspective. This is why I, for example, during tough times, I would in parallel, I'd read about some very challenging historical times like World War II or China's Cultural Revolution. Because to remind ourselves, to put all this in perspective, people have faced, our ancestors, other people have faced much worse times than this. So you know, we will sail through this, but you have to actually have that perspective in your mind. So those are some of the ways that I would advise you to cope. I think, Sridhar, a lot of things that you mentioned now, there seems to be a balance in everything. Like to manage or prepare for these times, I think you have to be mentally prepared as well. And that all comes with, you know, uh, with meditation or reading books or de-stressing what is required, I guess. Correct. And perspective, perspective. Because sometimes you are, today's challenge may loom so large that this is all there is. But the perspective, if you get that perspective from tough times other people have faced, tough challenges entire countries have faced, all of that. For example, understand what... Uh, that Turkey is going through, what Sri Lanka is going through now. Understand those. And so gain the perspective of that. That may keep us calm and, and allow us to navigate our current difficulties better. Mm. All right. Next, moving on to the next question. This is by Satish. How do business models such as MedTech, which have longer gestation period, navigate such economic cycles? Uh, there's a lot of regulatory plus, plus clinical validation, longer time to market. I totally agree. In fact, today I was talking to our own medtech folks, the approvals, how they said how long the approvals are taking, all of that. So this is actually a critical issue. It's true in anything to do with highly regulated markets, where this also creates a barrier to entry in those markets. And But once you break through, the barrier to entry works in the reverse direction where it almost becomes a kind of a guaranteed profit by the, the regulatory agencies. And this has happened, right? You saw this, uh, for example, in the U.S. in the recent baby formula shortage. But there's only two or three companies that serve the market. And when one of them had a factory that was closed due to uh, contamination issues, all of that, there was a shortage. Nobody else is allowed. And so nobody can easily enter the market. You know? And so this is, this is a problem in both directions. So my, uh, you know, I don't have an easy answer for this because if you're a startup, in a stretched budget addressing this market. My own suggestion is find another market that's less regulated and then keep the medtech as a longer term tree. That is what I would suggest. If you are stretched for money that way. I think that requires another set of, uh, you know, preparation of mind. You know, I need to get into a different stream altogether. It's not easy. Yeah. But you may not be able to wait one year for, a, uh, for approvals for your product. You may not have that runway. So what do you do? So. Right. All right. Next question is uh, by Abhinav. We have developed India's most affordable EV charger. When we hit the market last week, we realized that a competitor who raised $4 million has distributed 10,000 free chargers across India. 
most of which don't even work. We are confident that we have a cheaper and a better product, but how do we deal with the freebie culture? Yeah. So again, you have to go to certain market, certain uh, customers who will appreciate the offering. Because even if the uh, charge is free, if you are more efficient, you are uh, your actual running costs are lower, you can find markets. And they're not going to infinitely give it free. Maybe they can give 10,000. Can they give 1 million free? So there may be markets they are not reaching with the free offering. So go there first. That's what I would suggest. And develop a few customers who believe in your product. And who, in other words, it's better to have 10 passionate customers who believe in you rather than 1,000 customers who actually don't have much commitment to you. So that's what I would suggest in this. It's like keep competition on one side, find the market first, find the customer, and then I think things will start rolling. Yes. yes. Okay, next question is by Mohit. Uh, how do you calculate uh, TAM in a niche market? Let's say neurotech, where precedence is very less. Yeah, this is a tough one. Right? You are going into a market where you don't have a lot of history. So how do you estimate market size? And this is actually only have to be done by trial and error. There is no like objective scientific method for this. And this is true for, you know, even think about uh, new offerings. For example, how big is Metaverse going to be? You have to make a guess, right? You cannot say Metaverse will be 500 billion or 3 trillion or whatever, any number you come up with, or 5 billion, we don't know, right? So in a similar way, this, this type of thing, even in a small niche, any new market opportunity, you have to, uh, any new market, you have to estimate by trial and error. So the way, one way to do it is find some early customers, find out what they are willing to pay, and how many more such customers are there. From that, you get a, some estimate and then you can constant constantly refine that estimate as you as you gain more experience that is how i will i approach this problem all right so we have just a couple of uh, more minutes before the session ends but we'll try to um, answer a few more questions uh, this is by mr mahindra does talent acquisition still happen during the session what has your experience been last two bubble burst time uh, absolutely in fact uh, you will uh, in fact, some of the best talent may join you during uh, the session because that's when uh, you know most pe more people are looking for a job. There are fewer takers. So if you keep an open mind, you may find really good talent. And if you treat them well, take care of them, they may also uh, stay with you longer term. So don't uh, lose sight of the fact that ultimately it is a talent war. Ultimately, we are business is about how much talent you have. How many passionate people you have? How deep are they? You know, culturally aligned with your organization, all of that. So during downturns, you must continue that. Maybe at a lower pace, slower pace. Once you reach profitability, still I would say continue to hire people, but maybe at a slower pace, and invest in good people. Okay. Next up, we have the question by Pratik. How do you convince your team to accept unusual but logical decisions like the epic Zoho rural offices? You, you don't attempt it as you convince everyone. You approach it as, are there any takers for this idea? Meaning, it's not like I have to persuade all 10,000 of our employees to move. In fact, I have not persuaded all 10,000 to move. So, But maybe there are 10 who are willing to move. Right, who want to move. So start with the 10. This is the same thing with customers, right? You're not going to con convince the entire world to buy your product, but you don't need to convince the entire world. You only need to convince the first five customers, first 10. So in a similar way, if there are 10 employees who are willing to move, to go to a new location, uh, maybe that's you get started with that as a seed. And that seed then nurtured, you know, properly, then it grows into a big tree and a, maybe a big forest eventually. But that's how I see it. Okay, so we have a couple of more questions. I think questions are not ending. <laughs> but anyway, uh, let me project this one too. Uh, this is by Anirudh. As an electronic product manufacturer, I feel 80 to 90% of our raw materials from resistors to IC, some from China, Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. With geopolitical risk from China and absolutely no domestic base on the component manufacturing, this might lead to hyperinflation in case of war with China. How do we deal with this? Yeah, I, you know, the only solution is to start these component manufacturing units. 
maybe as a product manufacturer allocate some part of it to component manufacturing and and realize that a lot of the companies who are selling these are relatively small companies from china it's not like these are all 50 billion dollar the hemots that are selling these there may be a 5 million dollar player in china that is selling you the components so can you invest to take care of some of the critical components in this so that is sort I, i obviously i see you need fabs but other discrete components maybe there may be a potential that's one way one thing i would uh, look at right now and a uh, lot of supply chains are to be created in india there is no other alternative longer term so maybe start studying with some of studying with studying some of the easier components first and then climb the ladder okay i think i'll take up this as a last question maybe um this is by gorov being a saas product how do we manage expectation of larger customers demanding customizations in the core product we face this issue especially in india uh yes so really this means that you have to rethink right the customer is not coming for your product the customer has a problem they want a solution they don't care what your product boundary is they say i've got this problem solve this or else you don't have this business so you have to think whether is that customer really uh important to you it may be right this is your first customer and you don't have a lot of business maybe you will agree to do this right but you keep that as which of it is really core to the product which of it is something you have to do specifically for this customer try to keep them separate don't mix product management with what you are doing for the specific customer so if you are ta- taking that approach then you still satisfy this customer which may be crucial to your business crucial for you to survive in the intermediate term but at least you are now able to uh, keep that product evolution uh, as distinct from what you are doing for specific customers you may even want to keep a separate team that does the customer engineering like this so that's what i would suggest thank you shida okay i'm just saying this one last question because i really like this question <laughs> okay this is by uma is usp really important for a startup Uh, it's important for anyone right why should somebody pick your offering versus someone else and maybe there is no one else as is offering the customer needs it but that's most of the time that's not really true right almost anything you offer there are alternatives there's going to be competition in fact this is something that i will uh, 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 on this note people should always assume there's competition for whatever you do the default assumption is there is competition don't make the default assumption that what we do is so unique that nobody is there to compete with us that's a bad assumption in fact i always tell our product managers if they think there is no competition i say you have not searched hard enough search harder i say you will find competition so this is why it is important what is why do i stand out why should the customer choose me over those five other companies doing something similar so it is really important not just for a startup even for a established company product Okay, thank you, Shridhar. Uh, so I think we are wrapped up in the one hour time. So for all those who have joined us today, we will uh, share the recording uh, from our social media handles. We'll also try to address all the questions that you have asked. We're sorry we are not able to complete all of them, but we do have your email IDs, and we will get in touch with you. Uh, Shridhar, once again, thank you so much uh, for taking doing this session for all of us here. I'm sure it would have helped a lot of people who have joined today. And uh, if there are any more similar topics or anything that you'd like to know or how you can prepare yourself better. uh please let us know drop us your feedback and comments or uh, let us know through social media as well and we'll try to arrange another session for you thank you so much shridhar and thank you everyone who has joined us today it was wonderful having all of you here thank you namaskar thank you